Hi. This lesson is all about the idea of a lithofascies. It leads on from what we've been doing uh, about biofascies, which, if you remember, was uh, a unit of rock that could be defined by the fossils that it contained. So the name lithofascies then implies that we're talking about units of rock um, deposited in the same sedimentary environment that are characterized by li their lithology, the type of rock from which they're made. Now for this lesson, you're going to need the uh, lithofascies uh, handout um, all about James Ross Island in Antarctica. Okay then, let's go. Let's start with a definition. As I said, a lithofascies is uh, a unit of rock that has um, shared features in its lithology, in the rock type. Now, geologists uh, define this because it, it really establishes the geology of an area. When we look at uh, geological maps, for example, um, they're almost entirely going to be mapping lithostratigraphic units. Beds of rock that are recognisably similar. So we need to think about how we as geologists would actually go about applying this idea um, to the geology that we find in different places. Now to do this, we need to divide up uh, the geology of an area into what we call lithostratigraphical units. Um, and it's all done on increasingly common lithology. Increasing similarities between the rock types. And when we do this, we establish a, a hierarchical structure. So large groups that have very broad things in common, right down to much smaller units of rock, that may be uh, much more similar uh, to each other. Let me try and illustrate. The basic unit of uh, a lithostratigraphy is what we call a formation. Now, a formation is defined as a mappable unit of homogeneous lithology. Let's just break that down a moment. Homogeneous lithology means the same rock types. So, for example, uh, in a formation, you may not have a limestone and a sandstone within the same formation. They may be too different in how they form and the environment they form uh, to be put together. The hierarchy then establishes um, above that and below that. So, if we go below this, formations can be divided up into uh, what we call members. Member, members within a, a formation will have more in common. A bed, then, which is the smallest of these units, may only be a small feature um, in the geology, but it's lithologically distinct. That's, that's the same stuff all the way through. If we go up from a formation, a group is um, a collection of formations based on how they form. So it might, for example, be a, um, let's think, uh, a unit that deposits perhaps uh, or a selection of formations that deposit in a, a reef environment. A supergroup then, which isn't always used but could be, uh, might look at all of the environments, say, within a shallow sea. So we've got these different levels, these different hierarchy uh, or hierarchical levels of our lithostratigraphy. Let's try and illustrate how this works using a real example. This is James Ross Island in Antarctica. 
Uh, it's just off the Antarctic Peninsula. And the geology of this island uh, has been mapped. And it's divided then into three um, lithostratigraphic groups. You've got the Seymour Island group, uh, the Marambio group and the Gustav group. If we look at the, the geology that's described here, we can see that these three groups all roughly have something in common. So the Seymour Island group is these sandy siltstones with, with clay. Uh, the Marambio group is um, a collection of fine-grained sediments, a lot of mudstones. The Gustav group is a bit more uh, mixed up, but it's all um, clastic marine sediment. So these are rocks that have uh, some things in common, but you can see there's variation within that group. Now, what I want to do is focus on um, a small part of this, the area I've highlighted here, and to look at uh, the geology broken down into a bit more detail. Notice that this geological map that uh, you're looking at uh, is quite a broad area, so the, the detail that's on it is going to be a little bit less. So if we do uh, close in a little bit more, and look at the western side of the island. We get a more detailed geological map. Now what I want to do here is look at one of these groups. I want to look at the, the Gustav group. And you can see the Gustav group is broken down into uh, four different formations. Hidden Lake, Whiskey Bay, Kotick Point. Uh, and the Lagralius Formation. You don't, by the way, have to know any of these names at all. These are just, I just want to uh, illustrate how this works. If we look at what's in these uh, different formations, let me just colour the map in for you, just to make it a little more obvious. So the Hidden Lake Formation here, uh, the red colour on the, the map, uh, is sandstones and siltstones with cross laminations uh, deposited in a delta deltaic environment so we've got one sedimentary environment depositing a particular type of rock the whiskey bay formation uh, is turbidite deposits so that's uh, the submarine avalanches depositing um, sort of quite coarse clastic sediments the Kotick point formation uh, is probably in a um, a lower energy uh, marine environment and we've got interbedded medium to fine sandstones and some silty mudstones so much finer grain material so you can see that each of these formations is being deposited in a, a different environment all related to perhaps the same type of uh, area but one which um, has different sub-environments depositing these lithologically distinct units. And we can notice how similar they are. We can subdivide these. Let's look at the Whiskey Bay formation. So what we have here are distinctive um, sedimentary logs from different areas in this uh, on James Ross Island that show uh, how the Whiskey Bay formation varies across uh, this island. We can see that there's a variation in lithology. But all of these logs have um, some things in common. They all, for example, have quite coarse clastic sediments. But there's variations between them. So, for example, if we look at the, um, uh, the Brandy Bay member on the far left here, uh, we see interbeds there of coarser and finer grain material. The Lewis Hill member, though, uh, within this formation, 
is dominated by this coarse grain material. If you look at the Rum Cove member, that's all mudstone. Gin Cove is uh, is a, a a mixture of things. So although they all uh, have common features, there are in variations between each of these uh, members within the group. Looking at these names as well, I do wonder if. Uh, uh, the geologists who were there were on a on a dry camp for um, for a few months and were, were starting to crave a bit of booze, to be honest. But anyway, that's by the by. Let's have a look at what we could actually um, devise for ourselves. I've given you a simpler, uh, sort of more made-up version here. We've got... Um, Three sequences of rock, perhaps part of the same um, uh, group. Each, each of these have common features. But how would we link them together? We've already got a correlation shown uh, on this diagram. What's already been shown there? How have these been uh, divided up? How good is that a technique uh, to link together rocks in these different sequences? What's the strengths of, of that technique that's already on your diagram? What, though, looking at those sequences, may be the weaknesses of it? What I'd like you to do is to draw onto this diagram any other ways of correlating those rocks. How could you link them together? Can we draw, can we connect beds across uh, these three sequences? And can we then evaluate the strengths and limitations uh, of the second technique that you've used? Bear in mind what we've already been talking about in the lesson. Okay, I think this is a good time to press pause and have a go at that activity. See what you can come up with.